Welcome everyone to my mini reviews of all the anime coming out uh, this season in fall of 2018. Um, it's actually not all of the anime coming out. This is just the, the shows that I was able to catch. First episodes only, so I can't talk about you know stuff that happens later. This is just what I thought of the first episodes of each of these shows. Let's dig into it now. Starting with Anima Yell. This is a cute little series about a bunch of schoolgirls who are getting into cheerleading. Obviously, it's a very light, fluffy show. Um, I certainly enjoyed it. I thought it was, you know, um, nothing deep, nothing complicated, but um, managed to hit just the right notes in terms of being a, a cheerful show. Uh, nice, bright colors, very traditional anime stuff, right? So um, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, not something a show that I'm going to be you know, following very closely, but a, a relaxing kind of a thing. Uh, similarly, kind of was as Meals as Miss Beelzebub likes it, anime series set in hell. That's actually what hell looks like, if you didn't know, where everyone is pretty and or be shonen, and the main character is this guy here. You can kind of see him, who is the sort of chief assistant to Satan Beelzebub, who is this cute girl here who uh, kind of does her stuff pretty well but is otherwise something of a lazy uh, girl who just likes to lounge around in bed naked. So there's some fan service in it. Um, there's a little bit of romance aspect to it. It's, again, it, it's fun. Um, it's very much meant to be relaxing and just easy to look at. Very soft color palette in it, which I rather liked. Um... Like, like the other one, nothing really complex or deep, but something that you'll probably just kind of relax to and enjoy, um, and just kind of uh, fun in that sense. Then there's Bakumatsu. I'll be honest, I can't remember that much about Bakumatsu when I think back on it. It is a shonen series set in the Bakumatsu with various characters around the, um, uh, the opening of Japan to the West, telling that story from the perspective of the rebels. Um, so basically there was a conflict between the traditional, um, the traditional hierarchy and rebels who wanted to, uh, fend off the foreigners and keep Japan closed. And so this is a story from those rebels' perspective, which is a little more unusual. Usually it's more about the Shinsengumi, the, the big, um, police, basically, of the time, the special police. Um, as you can see, it has a, a nice kind of modern anime feel to it. Um, although a little bit more of a throwback to uh, anime of the past, uh, a little Wolf's Rainish actually. Um, animation, um, pretty much everything about it was pretty good down the road uh, in terms of being, you know, decent art uh, or decent animation quality. Um, you know, the character design seemed to meld pretty well. Voice acting seemed fine, but nothing really, you know, caused it to to blow up. Nothing, nothing really blew me away about the show. So if you're into that kind of thing, and certainly Bishonen characters, uh, I think you will find this a, uh, a fun ride. Uh, Between the Sea and the Sky was one of the big surprises for me of the season. Uh, it starts coming across as this relaxing slice of life show, and then expands into this massive sci-fi epic kind of a story, while also remaining very goofy. So trying to hit a lot of different tones at once. Uh, cute girl characters uh, basically being fishers in, the, in space. Uh, the setting, which is this future where all marine life has to exist off-world, is hard to believe and hard to, you know, hard to follow along with in terms of the setup. But I don't think you're really there for the setting. You're more there for cute girls in underwater submarines trying to fish and prove themselves uh, against the uh, predominantly male fishing population. This is actually still a real thing in Japan, is that... Fishermen are, are overwhelmingly male, and it's just very unusual for women to get into that um, that particular profession for a variety of reasons. So it's kind of playing off that thing still in Japanese culture. So interesting, um, but uh, just definitely definitely weird. Definitely a weird premise and weird characters. But, you know, no complaints. Then the conception, which <laughs> comes in and kind of tries to shock you. The It starts with the main character and his girlfriend. The girlfriend confesses that she's pregnant. Then they're whisked off to a fantasy world where it turns out that pregnancy is a thing. What's weird about Conception is it's basically, I believe it's based on a visual novel, or at least a video game, um, where the main character has to basically 
breed children with various girls, but it's not like like what what that actually is for us in real life. Um, and so then those those children that um, uh, that are created then grow up and be and become heroes. So it's this very weird video gamey premise because uh, he eventually apparently he he builds this harem of girls who he, he conceives with, but again it's not that kind of conception apparently. Um, it's odd. So there's kind of a there's a hentai feel to it, but no actual hentai. Um, the art is actually uh, the, the animation is actually above average. Uh, some of the action animation here is really lovely. And I really like the character designs, oddly enough, but it's a weird one. Uh, it's a, just, a, just a bizarre premise. Um, obviously trying to be sexy, but it can't be too sexy for prime time. Um, so one of those shows that I think will find its audience, but it's never really going to break out probably and become a, a massive hit. Because it's just so strange. Um, so I enjoyed it. Again, probably not going to follow it too too closely. Um, then the one, here's one of the more problematic ones of the season. Takaichi, a more serious adult manga about a male model who is uh <laughs> yeah um um about a male model who is facing off against and, and trying to beat another very successful male model um but i don't think it's a spoiler to say that um uh there are some homosexual overtones in this there's i mean homosexuality is, is, a, is a very strong element in this manga and um, at least in episode one, some of it's not consensual. Uh, it's kind of creepy. And I had a difficult time with it because it felt like it's okay because they're gay. Um, and there's just, there's an aspect of it that just left me feeling very uncomfortable. Um, not because they're gay, but because there is some non-consensuality elements to it which seem to be very much glossed over in the story as just, well, that's just what he's like. I don't really, I'm not crazy about that. So um, I found it a very, I found that very problematic. Interestingly, though, it is trying to clearly be a much more um, adult kind of a storyline in the sense that it's about grown-ups being grown-ups with each other. Um, there is some over-the-top you know, animation to it, but it is much more about everyday work and, um, you know, maintaining your work life and your personal life and those uh, uh, aspects. So, interesting to see something that's, that's much more in the seinen aspect of things, um, but it's just, that's, uh, it just, it creeped me out too much for me to, uh, certainly follow it much more beyond that. Uh, then there's Double Decker, which is a sci-fi fantasy action anime. I believe it's all CGI. Um, or at least, you know, CGI animation stuff. And there's another show where I couldn't tell you much of anything that happens in this episode. Uh, characters come together, there, there's action and fighting, and that's pretty much it. Again, it was enjoyable, it was fun. Um, I wouldn't, you know, recommend folks not watch it, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend folks watch it either. It just there, There's nothing really to, to latch on to for me for Double Decker. Um, seems like one of those... Um, you know, every season has a few action shows, which are just um, entertaining, but probably aren't going to remain with you for the rest of your life, right? And that's fine. It's just, it fits into that category. Um, now we've got to move on, because we're going alph alphabetically to Goblin Slayer. This was the one that's caused a lot of attention, and a lot of people uh, talking online about it, because, and this is where I have to do have to get into some spoilers for the episode, to kind of plug your ears for a little while. Um, uh, Goblin Slayer is about a group of characters in a fantasy world, and it's very much more of a D and D fantasy world rather than an MMO world, who, or a video game world, who decide to go into a um, uh, a place and um, uh, go into a uh, a place that's, that's been overrun by goblins and fight off the goblins, uh, and they fail. Uh, the goblins proceed to kill the males and um, rip the clothes off the girls and um, have their way with them. Um, so what's what's shocking about this is the fact that it's treated very realistic and grittily, right? A character gets stabbed in the stomach and doesn't just, you know, grunt and fall over and die, starts screaming and falling over and trying to do something about it. And then others come in with, 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 
with daggers, and it's, it is obviously horrendously painful to be stabbed in the stomach. Um, it's that kind of stuff that is kind of, um, you know, it, it is it is meant to be like, no, this is not, you know, something kills you and then you derez. It's dark. Um, and then it starts dealing with why that is, why the goblins are doing this. Um, it is meant to be clearly very much about a much more bestial society than ours is. And that does come across as um, problematic to some people. A friend of mine called this show Problematic with a capital P, um, partly because there is sexual violence against female characters in this show. But importantly, that is treated as horrific. Like, there's no fan service in this episode. It is very much about the fact that that is a horrific thing to do, and we're going to investigate, you know, why those characters do it and what's going on, why someone would do that. So, I'm intrigued by Goblin Slayer. It is certainly very mature. It's certainly not for kids. Um, very, very hard. Uh, um, uh, it's, yeah, it's uncomfortable. It is deeply uncomfortable multiple times in the first episode, but I think that makes it interesting. So, I'll be interested to see where it goes. Um, but, whew, that's a tough one. Moving on to Himote House, which is kind of the exact opposite of Himote House. Um, so the thing about uh, Himote House is that it is, an, again, an all-CGI show, very nicely animated, no complaints about the CGI in here, uh, about a group of girls all living in a house um, uh, together. It comes across as a very light, fluffy show about a group of, of girls just, you know, all living together. Um, until you get to the end of the episode, and I won't, I won't reveal what that is, but it kind of takes a turn at the end of the episode. Not like, you know, dark death or anything. But um, there is a twist, which was kind of interesting at the end. Um, and it feels like the kind of show where they're probably adapting a four coma or a web manga. And they're just having fun with it. They're, they're, they're just throwing jokes at the screen. Um, the actors feel like they're having fun with the characters. And so it's, again, one of these light, fun shows that is um, easy to watch. They're also short episodes. Um, and that I think would be a uh, kind of a fun approach to a lot of these uh, 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 these stories. So um, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I would probably watch more of it. I, I wouldn't mind that at all. Um, the CG animation is uh, you know, not incredibly lush, but uh, definitely you know definitely gets across what it needs to. No, no complaints. Uh, moving on to Hinamaru Sumo. Now you all probably know I'm not usually into shonen titles. Uh, and this is definitely shown in right down the line. Uh, it's about a group of characters who want to start a sumo club. And so, yeah, there are a lot of, of, of teenage boys wearing nothing but those sumo outfits in the show. Uh, the show does an interesting job of making sumo feel dramatic and, um, and interesting in the way that a good sports anime will, where you get drawn into the sport. Um, they also don't shy away from how silly these these guys look in these outfits, uh, and they kind of celebrate that, um, and not in an over the top way, not not in a way that that is goofy. Um, but I really actually appreciated the fact that they're like, yep, yeah, this this is the sport. This is just what this is, and you kind of have to get used to that to appreciate what it is. That's totally cool, I think. So, um, and they pack a lot into episode one, a lot of sort of backstory and and setting up the characters. And um, it also has a pretty high animation budget, at least in, in terms of episode one. Um, so, yeah, as somebody who's not into sumo myself, like, I, I appreciate it intellectually. Um, I was definitely sucked into that first episode. Uh, again, one of those things, you you know, certainly not for everyone, but they did a really good job of making it a, um, you know, a, a show folks would enjoy. Uh, Jingai-san no Yome is about a boy who ends up engaged to a, a creature, a weird creature, uh, this weird thing. It is clearly a light comedy, probably, again, based on a web manga or a four coma. It's, it's, again, it's one of those shows that is, the concept is so goofy that I ended up, mm, I didn't enjoy it very much, partly because the humor is so, because the, the premise is so bizarre the, the humor couldn't really work very well. It's either the main character reacting in shock to things happening, or it's kind of everyday life situations with a weird character. So unless you're really into, 
you know, it's so random lol. I don't think it's going to be for, for many people, but it might be for that kind of person that's kind of throwing that in, right? That this is just kind of looking for something that is just, um, has a bizarre premise and is going to, th- going to flow along with that. Um, so interesting in that premise, but it just didn't really, didn't really grab me very well. Um, same thing with Merc Storia. This is a fantasy series. Um, yeah, there's, there's characters running around a fantasy world. Um, I'm sure there's stuff happening in the first episode, but darn if I can remember any of it. It just, it, it flowed right past me. Um, and I say it as somebody who remembers a lot of anime, but that one just felt very generic to me. Um, again, not in a terrible way, but just, okay, that's a nice, fun thing, but whatever. Um, now let's move on to Miss Vampire Who Lives in My Neighborhood. I'd heard about this one before it came out. Uh, the basic premise is that this girl discovers that there's this vampire girl who lives near her and ends up hanging out with her. Um, and it's, it's very much a sort of slice of life comedy. And I was surprised at how much I got invested in the, the story, partly because the staff do a really good job at pacing and at revealing a little bit of character and at building re- the, the relationship of these characters over the course of the first episode to where I understood where the characters were coming from and the comedy landed. Uh, it's easy for this, in this sort of situation, where it's, oh, it's a vampire girl and you're kind of living with a vampire girl and or not living with necessarily, but you're hanging out with her a lot. Uh, it's easy for that to turn into obvious jokes or just random jokes. And these are more situational. The, this felt like a a well-thought-out introduction to these characters in this, this premise, which... I, I certainly enjoyed. I think it's one of those shows where, again, if you like comedy with an, with an odd twist, I think this definitely fits in that, uh, um, you know, in, in that in that situation. So, um, uh, yeah, to me, you know, Miss Vampire is one of those shows. Where, like, yeah, I can see myself watching more of that. Not massively high priority, but uh, lovely, nice animation quality. Um, again, nothing that really blew me out of the water in terms of all those aspects, but um, you know, no problems there. Speaking of problematic, my sister, my writer. This is clearly trying to be, or I think this is trying to be the I Can't Believe My Little Sister is This Cute kind of a show of this season. Um, um, main character writes novels, light novels, discovers that his little sister has written a novel. Um, she is always badgering him. And then he finds out that the novel she's written has, has won an award. Um, and she wants him to kind of be her, you know, her physical face to people. She can't admit that she actually wrote this novel because the novel is about a little girl who has a crush on her older brother. So incest. Yay. Now, they don't go too far with it in episode one. Um, it appears to be more that just she has a, that, you know, the real girl has a, um, I don't know. She really likes her older brother, but there, there doesn't need to be anything physical about it. But it's hard to see. Um, it, it's hard to see where they're going with it. it. It's one of those shows that could be really quickly, or they could dial it back and it could be more of a fun series. What I was hoping is this, this would be a show about a guy and a, and a girl who are both capitalizing on this whole incest thing and um, write novels that are unexpe- unexpectedly successful and then have to deal with the fact that everyone assumes that they have those feelings for each other. And that they don't, but they care about each other. And you have to kind of sort through the fact that, you know, caring about somebody doesn't mean that you are you know, physically attracted to them. Um, so that that was a, a tack I was hoping they are going to take. It's unclear from episode one. You know, they, they didn't go too hardcore in one direction or the other. So we'll see. Um, I love the character designs. I love the overall um, tone and feel of the show. Um, you know, nice animation budget. Uh, traditional kind of color schemes. Uh, but yeah, I, I really liked that idea. I, 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 I liked the premise and where it might have gone, and I liked the various elements of it, but it might get really creepy. So who knows? What we, say, what we see a lot. Um, Radiant, another shonen series, fantasy shonen series, in the... <coughs> excuse me. Uh, in the overall mode of like a fairy tale, or maybe even a Yu Yu Hakusho. 
Uh, young man is an apprentice magician um, trying to use magic to save the world. People don't really like magicians or mages, whatever, because they tend to cause you know devastation, even though they're trying to save people. So it's about you know fighting back against prejudice, basically. <clears throat> um, I typically don't like Shonen. This again did a good job of establishing characters and creating a situation that made sense. Um, I think one of the big problems is that the, the protagonist is a very by the books shonen protagonist and hasn't shown a lot to make him different. Um, you know, one of those one of those elements where it's I don't know um, where. I like. I really like the world, the 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 fantasy world they set up, where it's 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 hitting this sort of middle ground between completely generic medieval fantasy and kind of weirdness. Um, I like the characters, but the protagonist was just uh, he's just so bland. Um, yeah, he's. I mean, when I say bland, he's generic. The he's a character who's always jumping into danger, no matter what's happening. Um, always trying to protect people, but there's just nothing beyond that. So. I'm hoping they develop some uh, develop it somewhere. Pretty high animation budget, um, and yeah, there's there's definitely something there, some core there, and probably one of those shows where once you get a little ways into it, it really starts to pick up and, and get interesting. Um, but as of episode one, there's just it wasn't enough there for me to really get get excited. So if you like you know shonen fantasy series, definitely something something to uh, uh, to look for. The, one of the weirder name shows of the season, Rascal Does Not Dream of Bunny Girl Senpai. Uh, a friend of mine described this as a Monogatari series without the flashing text on the screen all the time. So if you've ever wondered if that, if a show like that w was that, you know, um, would be that interesting without that visuals flair, you can get, it, get a sense of it here. The image looks very sexy and ridiculous. The premise is that this girl is slowly turning basically invisible. People aren't noticing her at all. And she can walk right by somebody and, like, wave their hand in their face, and they won't even see that she's there. And so she started doing increasingly ridiculous stuff to see if people will notice her. And she comes across this guy um, who does notice her, and they start talking about, basically, depression and um, desires to feel noticed and to feel important. Um... I found this show really interesting, and it's a good example of how I think anime fandom tends to tends to divide, where I like shows that explore these various things, even if it's not got a lot of action, even if it's not you know visually impressive. I find these themes interesting enough um, that I really wanted to 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 dig into it. Um, Nick Owens is saying he had a, a bit of a Haruhi Suzumiya vibe, and I agree there are shades of Haruhi to this. Um, certainly not in in uh, in in very overt ways, but in that sense of subtly parodying certain aspects of anime, um, delving into certain aspects of growing up and responsibility, and and um, starting to see things outside of yourself and starting to grow up in adolescence. Um, so I I think, and of course there's a bunny girl outfit, which is you know yeah, uh, but that that goes back decades. Um, so yeah, there's, this is a show I think that is more for the thinking otaku, uh, and it's not going to be even for all the thinking otaku, because there is a lot of just, you know, it, it's, it's a slow series, but I thought it was fascinating. Um, I also appreciated the more muted color palette, the fact that it's a little darker, um, and, uh, um, the fact that it, you know, it's not trying to be your typical anime in every respect. So intriguing, um, definitely something, <laughs> something that, uh, caught my eye. Um, now I gotta ch talk a bit about uh, Rewrite It. And again, this is based only on episode one. So this is the most recent anime series uh, character designed and conceived by Yoshitoshi Abe, the character designer behind Seal Experiments Lane, Nia Under 7, and uh, Technolize. And we need to, I need to sort of give some background to this because there was a preview of this that was reported on on Anime News Network and the reviewer trashed it. Um, just really kind of hated this show. Turns out the reviewer is a massive fan of, of Abe and really wanted this show to be more than it is. I found Rewrited to be a very interesting premise um, with characters and an unusual premise with uh, characters set in a, in, a, in a very interesting sort of situation. 
Um, I, I like that it is about adults. It's about characters who are faced with an unusual situation and are trying to find a way out of that in a non-typical shonen way, right? Or non non-typical anime series uh, way, where they're not just going to push through and, you know, fight off the bad guy. Uh, it, it feels more like adults or, you know, um, characters close to adults dealing with these interesting aspects of, of, of this unusual situation. It, the character designs don't look much at all like Abe. They've been kind of genericized down to a, a very normal anime style. Well, that's okay. Um, you know, disappointing, but you know, that's, that's fine. We, you know, we can live. We can chill. Um, but I think there's something there. I think there's a lot a about rewrited that can go in interesting directions. Um, I think it's, it's certainly not going to be one of these uh, blow-your-mind shows for every single episode. But I'm willing to give it a chance, and there's certainly enough there to pull me in and make me curious about what's going to happen next, which is really all I ask of, of most anime. So I think if you, you know, if you've heard of Rewrited and kind of written it off, give it a try. Give it a try. Moving on to one of the sports anime of the season, One with the Wind, which is about a group of, um, uh, of runners. So... There's this very famous race in Japan that goes for hours and hours, a foot race. And it's like, adver not just advertised, it is uh, broadcast live on Japanese television every year. It's a huge thing. I think every two years. Massive, massive thing. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, Uzumade is coming up. Um, and this is about a group of people who are going to try to run that race. And so it's clearly getting the team together, getting the gang together to figure out how to run the race. And there are the fairly typical set of anime characters in this, not in a negative sense, but in the sense that there's, there's the prodigy who doesn't really want to do it, but really needs to. Um, there's the person who's really, really into it. Um, there are, there's kind of the comic relief characters. You know, all, those, all those pieces are there in a way that I think kind of works. And again, what I like about this, like the other one, is... Um, these are characters in college, I believe. And so it's not that typical high school insecurity thing. These are characters who are much more defined in who they are and where they want to go in life. And folding this into that, you know, that approach to what they're going to do. They all happen to live in the same house. Uh, although not just happenstance. There's a whole thing behind that. But... Um, Again, if you like sports anime, <laughs> I think this is going to be pretty much kind of what you're looking for. Unfortunately, one, one of the problems it's going to have, and I'll be curious to see for those who watch it if it, if, it, can he, if it has this problem, it's hard to make foot racing feel all that dramatic. It can be done, but we all know what the human body looks like in a tracksuit. So it can't really look very sexy, it can't really look very, uh, you know, over the top, Again, it can be done with certain ways of movement, but it's really hard to make that work over the course of 13, 26 episodes. So we'll have to see if folks remain engaged in this show just based on the, the movement and the animation. Again, you know, good animation budget, um, very um, realistic color palette, so not too bright, not too dark, not too soft. Um, interesting show on, on that. Again, one of those shows that I would not mind watching more of, I probably won't watch too much of. But um, kind of a fun one. Also a fun one, Skull Face bookseller Honda-san. And uh, this isn't quite what the show looks like, but it is a, uh, it's a series about a, a bookseller who also happens to be a skeleton and the various customers that come in. It is much more of a... Instead of being about books, it's more about customers. You know, what, is be, what it's like um, working with people who come into your store and ask for ridiculous things. And, you know, I, I want a book. Um, it's red. You know what that book is? It's the red book that you have. That kind of stuff. So um, I enjoy what I saw. It's short episodes, web-based, very silly, um, but clearly ground grounded in realistic, you know, situations. So um, that was one that I again I certainly enjoyed. Um, nothing deep that I could I could tell, but fun. Um, a lot of ridiculous stuff. Then moving on to, uh, and I forget how it's supposed to be pronounced, but I'm going to call it SSSS Gridman. 
based on Tokusatsu show. Um, odd show. Uh, it's by Trigger, so expect all the the, the, the traditional Triggerisms. Um, <coughs> I really like the first episode because it does the Tokusatsu thing in a I want to say realistic way in the sense that you know there's a a big fight between like a, a giant you know um, basically guy in a rubber suit and a giant you know rubber monster kind of kind of thing and it devastates the city like it, it's like a disaster it, it is a tre- tremendously dangerous you know destructive thing that this happens but then there's this you know understory of this kid who gets to fight as this you know, giant thing and I really loved that that approach to it uh, and a trigger seems to be taking a slightly different approach with Gridman, where it's not as, um, it doesn't go over the top in as many different directions, if you will, as, say, Dong the Franks does, where Gridman feels like we're going we're gonna to go kind of absurdist with the tokusatsu stuff, but everything else is going to be a little more gritty and grounded. So, curious to see where that goes. If nothing else, Trigger stuff is always beautiful to look at, so it might be worth just for that. Um, again, I enjoyed it. I like the approach to it. Um, I like the overall color scheme, although it's pretty traditional anime stuff, um, trigger anime stuff. But, you know, certainly, certainly, a, um, again, if that, if that's your bag, I think it will definitely fit that, uh, fit that bag, if you will. Uh, moving on to that time I got reincarnated as a slime. This is a manga I've been reading for some months and greatly enjoying. And it's been adapted now into an anime series. From what I can tell, the anime is moving pretty quickly through the story of the manga, which is good. Uh, basic idea is a um, average Japanese salaryman is well, he dies, and is reincarnated as a slime in a fantasy world with some extra abilities that a normal slime wouldn't have. And then it's about how he learns about those abilities, how he figures out what to do. <coughs> One of the reasons I like anime is because anime often brings novel solutions to traditional storytelling problems. One of the reasons I like Tenchi and Utna is that the way they told their stories um, revealed a lot without people having to sit down and explain to you through dialogue. Slime does this amazing thing where you get to see what it's like being born as a creature with no eyesight and no ears and no mouth. You're just a blob. So what's that like? What do you observe? Or what do you sense? How do you absorb things? What does that feel like? Um, and then, you know, moving on and moving on from there and growing and, and, and learning new things. Um, if nothing else, Slime is impressive for its visual storytelling. What I like about Slime the manga, and again, because so the first episode only gets up to basically him figuring things out and encountering one other um, creature down there where he is. Um, so not too much, I mean, there's a lot that happens in that first episode. Uh, and there's a nice little um, thing at the end, by the way. But... Um, sort of a post-credits bit. But um, what I like about th- this is that it is seeing how the slime reacts to things in the way a 40-year-old would. And that's, I think one of the things that's really interesting is that, you know, he, he's reacting in a measured, intel- intelligent way but also somebody who has a new lease on life, where now he can he can do things he couldn't before. So he's absolutely embracing this and taking advantage of his of his newfound life. Um, but he's not an idiot, right? He doesn't step in where angels fear to tread, like so many shonen protagonists do. So it has this wonderful sense of um, not just maturity but of someone thinking through the consequences of their actions and taking a a strongly calculated risk, which I really, really liked. Um, so, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I think it does a really good job of, of, of setting things up. I'm curious to see where it goes with some of its, its storylines. Um, 
Uh, there's some stuff that happens later on in this manga that, that can... Um, uh, that I I found a little fan servicey, unnecessarily fan servicey. So I'm curious to see where where they take that in in the manga, or in the anime rather. Um, but yeah, this is definitely one of the shows that I want to watch more of this season. Really enjoyed that one. Uh, moving on to Ulysses Jean d'Arc. I actually rewatched some of this for this uh, for this video, and yeah, it's it's a, a retelling of Joan of Arc with um, busty anime girls. Um, some of the characters, I believe, are, are switched around and changed, and there's some gender swapping, I believe. Um, when, when me and my friends watched it, we were like, oh, okay, that's, they, they, you know, they're changing things around. Okay, yeah, that happened. And okay, oh, uh, oh, that's a fun moment. Okay. When it was over, we turned to each other, and we were like, eh, that was, that was an entertaining use of 24 minutes. Eh, eh. You know, we, we just really, it just didn't really come together for us much. And it's weird, there's nothing that it does wrong. Um, the character designs are pretty generic. The the storyline doesn't really get. They do a fair amount of story, but it doesn't really you know get too far in episode one. So you can't blame it that much. Uh, the characters are pretty one note as of episode one. So eh, it just didn't really come together for us. I don't know. <coughs> this might be one of those shows that. <clears throat> It has that, those, those slow first couple of episodes and then accelerates over time and, and really comes together. Um, it's hard to tell. It's, it's really hard to tell on this one, but it just... Eh, it just... It, it just... Eh, was there. One show that's definitely not there is Uza Maid. Okay. So, this is one of those shows that... <sighs> is either going to be intensely creepy... Or just fun and goofy. Um, basically, it's got two characters, a, an adult woman uh, and a little girl, like a 12-year-old girl. The, or maybe, maybe she's 11 or 10 or 11, I guess. Probably, yeah, probably more like preteen. Um, the girl is going through some, some rough times, and she's gotten very, very precocious and very, uh, very hard to manage by her single father. Uh, the woman has uh, just gotten out of the military and on her way home she'd always look in um, or, you know, not look in on but she'd always walk by the house with this little girl and see her playing and it always brought a smile to her face um, and the girl hasn't been seen for a while when she walks, when this woman walks by the house again she notices that they're looking for a maid and she thinks, oh, that'd be great this would be a chance for me to, you know, um uh, you know, hang around and be, be with that kid. That'd be, that'd be great. You know, she, she seemed awesome. And she goes in and turns out that the kid is kind of a holy terror, an unholy terror at this point. Um, and she has no problem with this because she's ex-military. And anything this kid can throw at her, she can, you know, she has no problem with throwing right back at her. <coughs> but she also is really enamored with this girl. Now, I say enamored. There does not appear to be any physical attraction. There's, not, there's no creepy, lowly stuff going on here. But there is that thing where she's just, you know, she thinks this girl's the cutest thing in the world and wants to do nothing more than spend all of her time with her. So it straddles that line where there are aspects of it that can really feel creepy, but it never quite crosses over that line to where she's doing anything really, really, you know, disturbing. We might go there in later episodes. The thing about um, Uza Made is it has a very high animation budget. There's some, you know, really well animated sequences in this first episode. Um, they really spend a, lavish a lot of time on on the girl, uh, and the, you know, and and her you know, running around and being, you know, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, and, and again, it's it's um, it's like people who think dogs are really cute and so pick them up and hug them and you know do all and cuddle them that kind of stuff where there's nothing there's no physical attraction there but they just ooh you know want to do do that with with uh, with this kid it's it's that kind of a of a thing thus far in the show so i found it to be really cute uh, i found it to be I, I i found the premise to be really fun where this girl is just trying to piss off this maid in very childlike ways. And the maid is just, no problem. Like, it just bounces right off her. Um, I also appreciate the fact that the girl, 
girl is very much played like a child. You know, she's not precocious in the way that she's, you know, she can be devious, um, but it's very childlike deviousness. And on the other hand, she does have a complex emotional life, right? She is not just a, a simple being, right, that is, that is acting entirely on stimulus. So I did a good job. I think they did a good job with all those things. It just, it, it, it does, we've been so conditioned by so many of these weird shows, and I'm like, this could go in a really creepy direction. And I'm just, uh, I'm waiting for it to happen. So who knows? Can't tell. We'll see. Um, maybe, I, I don't know. All right, moving on to some of the last shows on the list. Uh, Swanyan, I'm, I'm sure I'm pronouncing this really wrong, Swanyan Sword Luminary, which is a big sweeping epic tale. It is a collaboration between a Japanese and I believe a Taiwanese animation studio trying to tell a Chinese-style epic story. So generals and armies and... And, um, you know, there's a guy taken as a slave to a court, and then he becomes kind of a, an engineer type, and there's lots of big stuff going on. <coughs> um, we found this really enjoyable. Uh, it's a big kind of a show. There's a lot of, of, um, a lot of characters, a lot of plot, and it, it, it came across like they're trying to accomplish a lot with the show. Animation budget is... Um, high-ish in the sense that, again, it feels like a big show and they're not going to have the budget to really show, you know, armies of millions like that you kind of want to in a big epic, but they're pushing that as best they can. Um, well, I was pretty impressed. This is a show that I would like to watch more of, um, but I, I am kind of a sucker for those big epic kind of stories that really feel like big epics. And I just like the fact that it's fantasy, um, but more like Chinese fantasy. Um, and that, that kind of stuff. So I kind of really in, enjoyed and, 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 you know, um, really found that interesting. Um, definitely a different kind of a show. Um, moving on to Zombie Land Saga. One of the other shows that folks uh, really got into this season. Um, and again, I got to do spoilers here for episode one because that's the only way to explain this show. So plug your ears if you don't want to hear spoilers, but there's no other way for me to explain this. Basically, the, uh, the main girl is a bubbly teenage girl who is quickly turned into a zombie. And then um, it is explained to her that she has to become, that she is going to be part of an all-zombie girl idol group. And they're going to get on stage and you know, perform as, as zombies, um, you know, as an idol group. So it is clearly a... Um, it is clearly a parody of idol culture, of idol anime shows, you know, Love Live and Idol Master and all those things. Um, but it seems to be a fairly loving parody in that... <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, it's having fun with the, the, the thing. And it, it is... Um, uh, it is poking holes in some of the various aspects of that industry, which can be very creepy at times and very ridiculous. So, um, but it's doing that in a way that isn't nasty, isn't mean. Uh, it's just kind of having fun with the concept and, and throwing that throwing that around. Uh, it also helps that the character designs are very cute. Um, it's very easy on the eyes and fun to watch. Also, importantly, it is very, very um, carefully paced humor where when they're trying to make a joke joke about horror, it's paced like horror. When they're trying to do lighthearted comedy, it's paced that way. You know, jokes have the time to land, or they move very quickly. Um, and they kind of build things up over the course of an episode. So there's an attention to detail here and a level of care that I find really uh, refreshing and I found it was really fun. When I've shown this to other fans, they just adored it. So this is definitely one of the uh, you know one, one of the more breakout shows of the season, one of the shows that I think you can show, you can show to a lot of anime fans and they'll they'll get it and they'll enjoy it. Uh, this is a great one for, for us to end up. Uh, I'm sorry, this is a, this was a great uh, show for us to end up on on when we were watching this stuff, and I'm glad we're ending it on here for for this particular uh, season preview. So those are the anime I watched this season. 
Um, I hope you found that useful. And I know this isn't everything, obviously, but uh, there's a lot of fun shows this season, which is always a nice thing. I'm glad to see that. So uh, hope you found that useful and hope you find some new favorite anime.